Today we start a new journey with nutrients, nitrate and phosphate. Turns out much of what we thought we knew has turned out to be only partially true, some of it all the way wrong, and some of the things that we now know for sure have had some unintended consequences in our reef tanks, causing us to play whack-a-mole where we solve today's problem but create a much bigger one tomorrow, often using the biggest hammer possible. So today, what you're going to see is my own personal journey with nitrate and phosphate over the last 17 years of maintaining reef tanks, starting with, is this really only about algae and pests? So the answer is no. Most of the conversation should actually be about the animals that we care for and their nitrogen and phosphorus needs, and how do we care for them best, and most of the series will actually be about that. But way back at the beginning, most of this all started with how do we fight algae and pests? Almost every conversation that I had in the very beginning stages of reefing was how do we use ultra low levels of nitrate and phosphate to starve the algae out? Having so little nitrogen and phosphorus available that it's a limiting factor to growth, it just can't grow without it. In fact, if we get it so low, you may even starve it to the point that it dies and disappears from the tank. So this isn't just aquariums, it's also the ocean reefs as well as other photosynthetic applications like agriculture. In a healthy ocean reef, in many cases, the phosphate levels and nitrate levels are down into the parts per billion, below where most of us could even test for, and the result of that is very little algae in most healthy reefs. But the flip side of that is also true. Most scientists will agree that those ultra low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus are also limiting factors to the corals as well. Meaning those parts per billion nitrate and phosphate limits the growth of the algae, but also limits the growth of the corals. And some of those things you can actually see in polluted areas of the ocean where nitrate and phosphate are elevated, and you'll see that algae is overtaking the ocean. So as it relates to photosynthesis, farming, and agriculture, it's almost the exact same thing. Last year's crops sucked up all the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the soil, and now the depleted levels are a limiting factor to this year's crops unless we replace it. And that's why most plant fertilizers are actually based on nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, this is the exact same thing in the aquarium. Yesterday, we added some fish food, which will add nitrogen and phosphorus to the tank. Then the corals, the fish, and the algae uptook it for their own metabolic processes. And then today it was depleted, so we add more fish food. Now the only thing that's different in this case is I actually want to care for the fish and the corals, and I just don't care that much about the algae. However, one of the big differences between these three organisms for this conversation is that the fish and the corals actually uptake nitrogen and phosphorus fairly slowly. Whereas the algae can actually uptake it very quickly. So, well, you can maintain really low levels and starve it off. If you have uncontrolled levels or you allow it to get very high, what you've essentially done is created a nitrogen and phosphorus battery for the algae to just explode once it takes hold. So is it nitrate or phosphate that's more effective at starving the algae out? And I believe it's very likely phosphate for a few different reasons. First, it's pretty well documented and it's been my own personal experience that maintaining 0.03 phosphate or lower will slow down the algae growth, in many cases stop it, and in some cases completely wipe it out. It's also very easy to test for with something like a HANA checker that will test all the way down that low. And there's many medias out there that will help you maintain those ultra low levels like GFO, lanthium chloride, or phosphate E. But the flip side of that with nitrate is it isn't really clear at what nitrate level will we slow down coral growth. And even if we did know it, most of our test kits won't measure down that low and the medias aren't as easy to use. Okay, so I've said algae and pests many times today, but what exactly does ultra low levels of nitrate and phosphate work on? In the last couple of decades, the reefing community has largely felt like all pests will be either limited by nutrients or fueled by nutrients, and that really hasn't proven out to be the case. Uh, so with some algaes, like hair algae, we find that lowering nitrate and phosphate, specifically phosphate, works really well. But on things like bryopsis, it may not. So why would that be? Well, some of these organisms actually just have different nitrogen and phosphorus needs, and they may uptake them differently as well. For instance, uh, it may very well be that bryopsis actually prefers ammonia and is able to uptake that before any other organism could. 
So there's also some confusion that often happens here. You might think you're at zero nitrate and phosphate, so why do I have these algae problems? But what's really happening is you're stuck in the middle of a cycle, meaning you're actually adding nitrogen and phosphorus every single day with the fish food, and the fish's metabolism is burning calories and adding nitrogen and phosphorus back to the tank every day as well. But on top of that, when you starved out that algae, it died and then broke down and added nitrate and phosphate back to the tank again to feed tomorrow's problem. So the big thing here is if you're going to fight a battle like this, you actually have to manually remove the algae so it breaks the cycle, gets the nitrate and phosphate out of the tank permanently, and another solution to that is actually filtration. So your filter socks and your skimmer and even your refugium, making sure that you maintain those on a daily level will help export the nitrate and phosphate and break the cycle. All right, so what about other pests which are commonly related to nutrients like cyanobacteria? With that red slime that grows on surfaces like sand, rock, or even sometimes on corals? I've seen no shortage of thousands of threads over the last couple of decades. They typically go with somebody asking for help because they have this problem in their tank. And most of the feedback is you probably have too high of nutrients feeding the cyanobacteria, probably related to your poor maintenance, and you need to fix that and get the levels back down to get rid of it. I don't say this kind of thing very often, but I'm gonna say that that thought process is actually total garbage and really not helpful. And I say that because after 17 years of doing this and talking to tens of thousands of reefers, I have never met anyone that has solved cyano by lowering nutrient levels in their tank. Never, not once. I've never seen it myself. We've tried it and it has never ever worked. So in that case, even if it has worked for someone, it almost never works, and I've also seen cyano break out in basically every level of nitrate and phosphate tank. So tanks that I think that have been maintained immaculately with the best filtration and maintenance still have cyano. Some of the ones that I've seen that have you know, 100 parts per million nitrate or even worse, unmeasurable, don't have cyano. I just don't see these things correlated in the way that all the advice should be related to this. In fact, I would just eliminate it from the equation. The same thing with dinos, which can look similar visually to cyano, but much more aggressive and take over the entire tank. And sometimes you'll actually see it completely disappear at night, come back in the morning, but by evening, completely overtaking the tank again. Just a much more aggressive organism, but similar to cyano, the advice was actually the same. You're in this pit because you have too high of nitrate and phosphate and you weren't maintaining your tank, and now all this nitrate and phosphate is feeding the dinos, but similar to that as well. I haven't met anybody who has actually reduced nitrate and phosphate and solved dinos. So this is one of those things we're still learning about and nobody knows completely for sure, but there certainly is some evidence that suggests that the real cause of dinos in many cases is actually zero nitrate and zero phosphate. And the reason for that is lack of biodiversity, specifically in new tanks and even more specifically in dry rock tanks. And even one more than that, dry rock tanks where we haven't added any bacterial biodiversity. So in many cases, we've actually seen people dose nitrate and phosphate directly to the tank, which would have been unthinkable before, but then watch the dinos go away. So why would that be? The reason again is that biodiversity. What the nitrate and phosphate have done is help fuel the growth of the beneficial organisms in the tank that just weren't there. And they weren't able to thrive or compete in an environment where there was no nitrate and phosphate and many of the species of dinos may actually be able to thrive in a low nitrogen or low nitrate environment or even low both. But in any case, adding some nitrate and phosphate allows the beneficial bacteria and organisms to thrive in the tank and outcompete the dinos. So again, we're still learning here, and this might be as much about getting the right nitrogen and phosphorus levels, not too low, but also not too high, as it is about understanding some of the sterile type tanks that we're developing using dry rock and getting the right biological diversity in there, either by adding a small amount of established live rock or even biological diversity that can come in a bottle, which many people have also used to solve dinos as well. However, probably more important than all of that put together is actually understanding that algae and pests are actually only the smallest component of the nitrogen and phosphorus conversation and it's really all about the animals that we're caring for and how phosphorus and nitrogen feed the animal. But more specifically, 
Is it the animal or the coral? Or is it the zooxanthellae that lives within the coral that utilizes the nitrogen phosphorus? And how can we use that information to produce a better result? And that's what's coming up. Today we answer the question, coral versus zooxanthellae, which one of these are we actually caring for? And it may actually seem like we're caring for a tank full of corals and thinking about the nutritional needs of the coral. In many ways we actually are, but deep within the coral's tissue is something called zooxanthellae. It's an algae that lives within the tissue of the coral and utilizes photosynthesis to provide as much as 90% of the energy and nutritional needs of the coral. So the question really is, if we care for the zooxanthellae, will the zooxanthellae then care for the coral? Today, specifically in relation to nitrate and phosphate. If we get nutrients right, what can we expect? It's been my experience that when we have a better understanding of not just how nitrogen and phosphorus influences the health of the coral, but also the algae that lives within it, we're gonna see fewer unexplained mortalities, we'll have better control or understanding of what influences the coloration of the coral, and even more important to that, when experiencing challenges, we'll make intuitively better decisions. Nitrogen and phosphorus atoms are the building blocks of DNA, amino acid molecules, and every protein cell on the planet, including plants, algae, animals, and bacteria. It's also critical to storing cellular energy, producing chlorophyll, and turning the sun's energy into metabolic energy for the coral. Without nitrogen and phosphorus, there'd be no DNA, no proteins, no plants, no coral reefs, and no life on Earth. So with that understanding, it's easier to grasp why in that previous episode in this series, we talked about ultra low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate and phosphate and how we can slow down or starve out the algae. And in some cases, not just slow down, but outright kill it. However, that misses the fact that deep within this coral, there's an algae known as zooxanthellae. So if we're starving out the algae in the tank, what are we doing to the nitrogen and phosphorus needs of the zooxanthellae that lives within this coral and also provides 90% or more of the energy and nutrition that the coral needs? So again, if we take care of the zooxanthellae, will it take care of the coral? Or better yet, if we're not taking care of the zooxanthellae, how will that show up in the coral's health as well? The coral itself is actually an animal and has some needs that are related to that. In this case, it actually needs some oxygen. It needs a source of amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, which will build all of its tissue. It also needs a source of energy or simple sugars that will support the metabolic function of the coral. But the big question really is, is where does it get all those things from? The answer, of course, is the zooxanthellae or algae that lives within the coral. It utilizes photosynthesis to produce all of those things for its own needs. However, it's so efficient at producing those things that it produces way more than it can use itself and then releases all the excess into the coral to support the coral's metabolic needs as well. So what does the zooxanthellae need to be able to produce those amino acids for itself as well as the coral, the energy for itself in the coral, as well as the oxygen or oxidants to help break down the waste? Well, zooxanthellae needs light, water, carbon dioxide, a source of nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as other minerals that regulate the photosynthetic process. So this is where the true symbiotic nature of the coral and the zooxanthellae and how they care for each other really comes together because the coral actually takes care of the zooxanthellae as well. First, obviously, by providing it habitat and a safe place to live. Also provides it water. It will provide it CO2 from its own respiration. It will also provide it minerals from captured prey, which may be very hard to find or scavenge in the water. And you might think that the nitrogen and phosphorus comes from the water as well, but in the ocean, that's often into the parts per billion. Much of the nitrogen and phosphorus comes from either digesting prey or from burning the energy that the zooxanthellae provided to the coral and then providing that nitrogen and phosphorus waste back to the zooxanthellae. A symbiotic nature where they feed each other. So this is a bit of a chicken and egg concept, which one came first or which one matters more. And if I had to pick one, I would consider the zooxanthellae first or what the algae needs to thrive because if I do that, the algae will provide 90% of what the coral needs to thrive However, this isn't the case of like an apple where if I ate 90% of it, there would be 10% left over, who cares? 
It's actually the fact that the zooxanthellae can't reproduce that last 10%. It doesn't have the ability to produce some of the amino acids or provide or scavenge some of the elements. The coral's gonna do that with capturing prey. So that's that last 10%, and in turn, some of the elements that are important to regulating photosynthetic process are also then captured as prey and then passed on to the zooxanthellae. So in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate and phosphate, in most ocean reefs, these things are considered limiting factors to growth, meaning there's so little nitrate and phosphate in the water, often the parts per billion, that it actually slows down the population growth of the zooxanthellae within the coral's tissue, and that, of course, slows down the amount of nutrition that the zooxanthellae can provide to the coral. So if we increase just the nitrate and phosphate availability in the water, often you'll see more nutrition, higher populations of zooxanthellae, and in turn, you'll also see more growth out of the coral. So outside of many test kits, you can actually see this visually in many tanks just by looking at the coral itself. So if you have really low availability of nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank, it will often look like a pale pastel looking coral just because there's so little of this algae living within the tissue that the natural color pigments of the coral shine through. However, if it's too high and the high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus are promoting rapid growth of the zooxanthellae within the tissue, it will often look like a very dark color coral, often a richer color of its natural pigmentation, sometimes going too far and turning totally brown, which is the natural color of the zooxanthellae. So the more of this you understand, the better you get at applying the knowledge, you might find that just a couple of canary corals are paying attention to the density of zooxanthellae or the color of the coral is actually a better representation of the overall phosphorus and nitrate needs of the tank and how you're doing with it than a test kit itself. However, unlike horsepower, where more is always a good thing, high density populations and all the nutrients that come with that may not be actually beneficial to the coral because right along with those things, is the increased amount of toxins and byproducts of photosynthesis and oxidants that can harm the coral. The coral actually has to get rid of those things or run the risk of bleaching. Now, if everything else is right, meaning that your flow is perfect, your lighting's perfect, temperature's for perfect, you may actually have a healthy coral. However, the increased chance of bleaching comes when, what happens when the temperature rises and the rate of uh, metabolism goes up in the coral and more oxidants are being produced and it has a harder time? Or maybe one of the power heads gets uh, turned off by accident or jammed. Or what if the lighting gets turned up just a little bit or a little bit longer? Now the coral can't deal with those oxidants. It becomes toxic and the coral has to bleach to get rid of all the zooxanthellae within its tissue just in a desperate attempt to survive. So this is another case where more isn't always better, the right amount is. However, outside of just energy, protein, and tissue needs, there's also other considerations, like most of these corals have a calcium carbonate-based skeletal structure, and most of us don't want to intentionally slow it down, and phosphate levels as little as 0.1 may slow it down as much as 50%, an exponential effect that actually happens over time, meaning not just 50% today, but 50% on that 50%, and some people may be able to grow out a tank in two years versus five. However, this does matter to most of us, and this is how it happens. This calcium carbonate-based skeletal structure is built by the coral by pulling ions of calcium and ions of carbonate out of the water, combining them together to build that calcium carbonate crystal or the skeletal structure that it lays its tissue on. Now, what also happens is the phosphates also attracted to that calcium carbonate crystal, attach itself to that surface, and then makes it less attractive to new calcium and new carbon ions, effectively slowing down growth, the more phosphate that's in the water, the more it's going to poison the surface of that calcium carbonate crystal and slow down the growth of the coral, often more than you think. However, one of the ways that we can manage this is consider the difference between inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus that we can test for in our water and the organic prey that has nitrogen and phosphorus within its tissue that the coral captures. And that's up next, nutrients versus nutrition. Nutrients versus nutrition. They sound awfully similar, but they're probably the most commonly misunderstood words in reefing. 
And once you understand the difference between nutrition and nutrients, it will change the way you think about everything that goes in the tank as well as out. Nutrients can really mean a wide variety of things, but most often just referring to nitrate and phosphate from the plant world. This is fertilizer, runoff, from farming, hydroponics, and water pollution. Nutrition, however, is food, energy, proteins, and mineral sources that contribute to health, growth, reproduction, and disease resistance with organisms or animals like our corals. There are a couple important distinctions between nutrients and nutrition. The first is every single living organism on the planet requires a source of nutrients, being nitrogen and phosphorus, to survive. That includes our corals, as well as the symbiotic algae known as zooxanthellae that lives within the coral. Here's the other important distinction. The coral, to survive, actually gets 90% of its nutrition from the zooxanthellae that lives within its tissue. However, the zooxanthellae isn't capable of producing nitrogen and phosphorus out of thin air or providing it directly to the coral. So this is part of that 10% that really, really matters that the zooxanthellae can't provide. So when I say that, I mean the zooxanthellae isn't directly creating nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate and phosphate and then passing it on to the coral. However, indirectly, it absolutely is. Indirectly, it's creating energy sources and amino acids that do contain nitrogen and phosphorus and passing that onto the coral. However, the important distinction here is that it's actually the coral that provided to the zooxanthellae first. The coral is capturing prey out of the water as well as absorbing small amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus through its tissue and then through its own metabolic process, providing it over to the zooxanthellae. But the most important component of this is understanding that it's the coral that is responsible for acquiring and distributing the nitrate and phosphate to the zooxanthellae and the coral itself. So you can start to see the gap now, that gap between 90 and 100, meaning that we know that the coral is actually going to get 90% of the nutrition that it needs from the zooxanthellae that lives within its tissue. But what about the other 10%? Does the 10% matter? Well, that 10% now we know includes nitrogen and phosphorus. And we also know that every single living organism on the planet requires nitrogen and phosphorus to survive. So certainly it does matter, but it really goes beyond that as well. There are things like missing types of amino acids that algae just has a difficult time replicating or can't at all and promotes healthy tissue production. There are also minerals that often come from prey. So that 10% that uh, is missing isn't just a small amount, it's things that the algae can't produce at all and a holistic approach to overall metabolic health. Another important distinction between nutrients and nutrition is with nutrients or nitrate and phosphate, more is definitely not better. With elevated levels of say phosphate, you'll see slower calcification, the coral have difficulty laying down additional calcium carbonate crystals for its skeleton, and with elevated levels of both, you'll also see increased amounts of population or density of zooxanthellae within the coral's tissue which can lead to bleaching when combined with other stressful events. So with nutrients or nitrate and phosphate, the right amount is the right answer. Elevated or unacceptably high nitrate and phosphate in almost any application, including aquaculture, farming, hydroponics, or even just general water quality in the ocean is all considered polluted water, end of story. However, with nutrition, is more better? The answer is often yes to a point. Meaning, if there's more prey or suspended organic particles for the corals or polyps to capture, there's more amino acids or other nutritive elements for the corals or polyps to absorb, it will often result in better health for the animal. However, I say this to a point because not if it results in polluted water. Meaning, not that there's too much prey in the water, it's if that prey isn't captured and then degrades down into nitrate and phosphate, which is, by definition, pollution. So filtration, really a foundation of an overall approach to heavy nutrition in, meaning filling in that 10% gap that the corals and zooxanthellae can't produce for itself without polluting the tank. This is also really closely tied to the difference of the nutritive values of the ocean, as well as in our tanks, why they're so different and which one we should be emulating. That's coming up next.
So one of the biggest conundrums that reefers face is we look to natural seawater as guidance for how we should maintain the chemistry in our tanks. We do this with calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, trace elements, pH, all kinds of things. But for some reason, not so much with nutrients or nitrate and phosphate. Often, nitrate and phosphate in our aquariums is dozens to hundreds of times higher than it is in natural seawater. So why is that? I believe it's largely because most of us are actually only looking at half the picture in our reef tanks. The ocean actually has two sources of nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate and phosphate. First, the types that most of us are already aware of, which are measurable with our test kit. It's dissolved nitrate and phosphate that's in the water. But the second one is prey or organic nitrogen and phosphorus. Organic meaning organics. It can be bacteria, it could be microfauna, it could be just decaying any type of matter, algae or waste from the fish. Anything that contains nitrogen and phosphorus and the corals capture as prey. So in the ocean, this is the second source. In our aquariums, it's often overlooked. So it's not that organic nitrogen and phosphorus doesn't exist in a tank, because it does. It's there with decaying food, algae, fish waste, all kinds of things that we're putting into the tank. It's that we're not including this in the thought matrix as we balance out the two types of nitrogen and phosphorus in our tank and try to emulate natural seawater to the best of our ability. So you really need to think about this from two different angles. So starting with that inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus or the nitrate and phosphate that we're all familiar with and test for, in natural seawater, the levels are often below 0.01 and into the parts per billion and actually below our ability to test for with most common test kits or checkers, it's just extremely low. However, in contrast to that in the aquarium, in a controlled environment where we're actually applying effort, in most cases, it's 0.04 to 0.1 which is dozens of times higher than it is in natural seawater. And uncontrolled, where you're not really paying attention to phosphate, can often be as much as one part per million, which is hundreds of times higher, and nitrate even higher than that. So in most cases, it's pretty unlikely you're gonna find lower levels of inorganic nitrate and phosphate in your aquarium than you would find in natural seawater, specifically in any case where you're actually adding food every day and fish are producing waste, which will both break down into nitrate and phosphate on a daily basis. So inside those glass boxes, even if we're seeing zero, zero in our test kits, we have to understand that zero, zero doesn't actually measure down into the parts per billion, and it's just unlikely that's the case. However, experience doesn't always match that. Some reefers actually have better results when they dose nitrate and phosphate directly to the tank and intentionally have it slightly elevated. They're getting better coloration, better tissue repair, and even just better growth. Overall, the health of the coral and the way it looks is just better. So why is that? It's not true in all the cases, but it's certainly true in some. And I believe it's because we're only considering half the puzzle. If we're not considering the organic sources of nitrogen and phosphorus that the corals would capture as prey, well, maybe we need to artificially increase the amount of dissolved nitrate and phosphate in the water to compensate for that. So compensating in this manner where we do one of these things extremely well and have largely forgot the other did produce results, but this was largely trying to overcome the fact that we didn't really understand how to feed our corals or the importance of it in the past. Now that we do, technology and the approaches to feeding our corals has evolved. We can now actually emulate natural seawater in the way that it was intended, which is we can have fairly low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, which are good for the corals in all kinds of ways that we've shared earlier in the series, but then also match the needs or dietary or nutritional needs overall by compensating with prey or organic nitrogen and phosphorus and match both needs at the same time. So the next question is, is the level of organic nitrogen and phosphorus or prey higher in the ocean or in our aquariums? That's a little bit more complex to answer because in our glass box, there's probably way more organics concentrated in the tank than there is in the ocean. However, the reason it's complex is it's more specific to the actual coral because the corals have evolved to capture something very specific that may or may not be in our tank or in the quantity that's needed. So just because it has more organics in our tank doesn't mean that there's actually more available prey. And because of that, the approaches have changed. So one of the approaches here is you'll see a lot of coral foods now that have a wide range of sizes and ingredients in it. 
to hit a broader array of corals. You'll also see things that have largely already been broken down, like amino acids, which are just more readily available to absorb than actual prey itself, a different approach to nutrition. So this is really the foundation of that heavy in and heavy out conversation that you've heard in the past. Heavy in, meaning we add lots of nutrition, we've added lots of prey and organics for the corals to capture. However, heavy out, the filtration, we get rid of all of the waste and excess food to make sure that we're maintaining low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, more similar to natural seawater. Again, heavy in and heavy out, actually the approach to maintaining natural seawater levels on both spectrums. You actually see this a lot in today's modern approaches to maintaining reef tanks. It just isn't spelled out in this level of detail. For instance, Red Sea's Reef Foundation program is founded upon using NO3 PO4X, which is carbon dosing, to help remove a vast majority of the nitrogen and phosphorus. It feeds on the bacteria, which may feed the corals, but they also have carbohydrates and amino acids that you add in in conjunction. Again, maintaining ultra low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, similar to natural seawater, but also providing the nutrition and forms of nitrogen and phosphorus that it could absorb as prey. Probably more even established and time-tested over decades is KZ and Zeovit. Again, kind of a murky area where it wasn't actually explained this way, but it is this. What we're attempting to do here is use media, carbon dosing, and bacteria to maintain natural seawater levels of nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate and phosphate, but then you add in all of the amino acids and other nutrients to help feed the coral's nutritional needs, which is again, a balanced approach that matches natural seawater. Another one is the approach that Worldwide Coral shared with us to achieve their results, which is that heavy in and heavy out, but this time based on their own homemade fish food, where they blend together different seafoods, but they add in the coral amino or amino acids and reefroids and different particular foods to make it a coral food as well, and then they feed it frequently throughout the day, on the hour, every hour, coupled with filtration to remove all the waste. However, there's one big difference here. Worldwide Corals had shared with us they understand the value of fairly low levels of phosphate. However, they're just less concerned with nitrate and they may let that rise a little bit higher. So this is the question. Is it about a specific value or is it about a ratio? And that's coming up next. Is there a magic ratio, a perfect balance between nitrate and phosphate, where regardless of what the actual levels are, elevated or not, if we maintain that perfect ratio to each other, the corals thrive, it's the answer to algae, dino, cyanobacteria, and nutrients in our reef tanks. The conversation has evolved from just concentration or parts per million of nitrate or phosphate in the tank to maybe something different, like a ratio, especially in relation to what happens when one of these things is limited and the other one is abundant, and what types of organisms grow in this environment. So the answer to this question is we don't have all of the answers yet, and we're still learning. I believe some of these things wholeheartedly and other aspects are pretty doubtful, but there's one thing that's true for sure. The evolution will be found in the desire to find out. It's been pretty well documented in the ocean that when nitrogen or phosphorus is either elevated or depleted individually or extreme ends of the ratio, it often produces increased likelihood of pests overtaking the area. And the same is probably true of our aquariums. A big portion of this conversation is over 90 years old. With the Redfield ratio, Alfred Redfield discovered that the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus is a fairly consistent 16 to one meaning for every one part of phosphorus, there's 16 parts of nitrogen throughout the world's oceans, meaning not just dissolved nutrients like nitrate and phosphate, but also the biomass of collected phytoplankton and organic nutrients in the ocean, all 16 to one. Now, when you convert that 16 to one nitrogen to phosphorus to nitrate and phosphate, which is what we commonly test for, it's actually 10 to one nitrate to phosphate. So for every one part per million phosphate, there'll be 10 parts per million nitrate. So the big question here is, is that 10 to one nitrate to phosphate just a happy accident and where the ocean just landed and tends to thrive? Or is it actually a ratio, more than just a specific number that travels up and down and has predictable results in our aquariums? These are the questions we're attempting to answer. There's a slew of resources, websites, and calculators that are dedicated to some of these ratios, 
they will tell you what they believe will happen when you deviate from them, not just at the low end, but the high end as well, and which organisms are more likely to thrive in that environment. Understanding that phrase more likely is important because you haven't created a near certainty of anything, just increase the chances by creating an environment of nitrogen and phosphorus, which is optimal to some organisms over another, just giving them a leg up. The closer that you get to the optimal range for that organism, and the further you get from another, increasing the chances of that happening. But again, not certainty, just increasing the chances. So it's absolutely true that most photosynthetic organisms have a preferred ratio of nitrate to phosphate, and when you meet it, they thrive. You can see that ratio listed on the side of almost every plant fertilizer. Some ratios better for different plants, stages of root production, leafy growth, and flowering or fruiting. It's undeniable that different ratios produce different results with different organisms, and when you meet that organism's needs, it thrives and others don't. This is likely most commonly observed at the extremes, where there's basically no phosphate or phosphorus available in the tank, but there's adequate or even elevated amounts of nitrogen or nitrate, or the inverse with almost no nitrate or nitrogen, but elevated phosphorus. In this case, some organisms will do very poorly and some will thrive. Now this could be that we just created the optimal ratio for that specific organism, or it could just be that it's better equipped to scavenge in an environment where nitrogen or phosphorus is limited. But in either case, they're both competing for space now. And in our case, most of us would like to see the coralline algae, beneficial bacteria, or even corals win out over the pests. So the big question or debate in all this is, is it concentration or is it ratio? Meaning, if it is ratio, do the effects of this scale infinitely up and infinitely down? Or is one part per million nitrate and a tenth of a part per million phosphate, which is fairly low concentration, going to produce the same results or allow the same organisms to thrive as 10 parts per million nitrate and one part per million phosphate, which is considered fairly high? So both of these are a 10 to one ratio, but a different concentration, one high and one low, Will the exact same organisms thrive in either environment based on the ratio, even though the concentrations are different? And the answer is probably not, but I also have to admit that I don't think that we know that definitively, and it might, and it might be something entirely different. My own belief on the Redfield ratio and similar types of ratios and how helpful they are is belief is about all you're gonna get. There isn't a lot of hard data out there other than emulating natural seawater tends to produce the highest percentage results. The further you get away from natural seawater concentrations, the less likely that the results will hold true. So don't play mad scientist here and go chasing numbers. These are just guidelines. Probably the most underappreciated piece in all of this is the food we put in our tanks. Some might be five to one or even 40 to one. And even if I wanted the most basic approach to all this, avoiding climbing extreme ends of the ratios and playing mad scientists trying to fix it, how can I do that if my food won't let me? And that's coming up. You may never have thought about this, but your food selection might very well be the reason why you've nailed either nitrate or phosphate and individually one of these is stable in your tank, but the other one is constantly rising. This really hit home for me for the very first time as I'm monitoring the tank cycle of my own tank at home. For months I've been feeding this tank, the lights are off and presumably there isn't a whole lot of nutrient uptake from any organism in the tank other than the fish and the input is just what I'm feeding. However, after a handful of months of feeding the tank every day, I test the nitrate levels to be five parts per million, which for me is a little high, but also in a range that most people would probably be okay. But phosphate was a different story. It was 0.5, which is a level that almost everyone would find too high. However, there's a couple interesting factors here that five parts per million nitrate and 0.5 parts per million phosphate just happens to match that 10 to one nitrate to phosphate Redfield ratio that we talked about in a previous segment. However, is that really desirable? Well, it really depends on your goal levels, specifically your nitrate levels, because what you're about to see here is the disparity of why it's so hard to maintain fairly low levels of phosphate when you really don't care about nitrate as much. For instance, apparently the food that I'm feeding maintains about a 10 to one ratio, meaning that if I had one part per million nitrate, I'd have 0.1 part per million phosphate and largely okay for me. 
However, if I let the nitrate go, inevitably the phosphate's going to scale with it and outside of a range that I feel okay with. Taking an even deeper, a more impactful look at this, imagine if I had selected a food that was five to one nitrate to phosphate, meaning that when I got five parts per million nitrate, I would have one part per million phosphate, which almost everyone would find ridiculously high. The inverse here is also true. Imagine if I had selected a food that was 20 to one nitrogen to phosphorus. That means when I hit one part per million nitrate, I'd actually have 0.05 parts per million phosphate which is close to most people's goals. So here's the conundrum. Most reefers do care about maintaining fairly low levels of phosphate, similar to natural seawater, because it absolutely will slow down calcification and growth, probably more than you think, if you let it rise above that. It also affect coloration, however, less so with nitrate. So many reefers just don't care about nitrate as much, but in this case, if you think about the food now as a ratio, if I let nitrate rise, phosphate's gonna go with it. So this is why your goals and approach matter. If you're finding that either nitrate or phosphate in your tank are independently rising and the other one's okay, what you're gonna have to do is play a little bit of mad scientist to get one down over the other. I'm gonna have to pick a filtration method that only removes phosphate or only removes nitrate. And there are chemicals like uh, lanthium chloride or phosphate E or GFO that will suck out the phosphate and probably the most popular method for that but I'm now reacting to it. Option two is I actually just pick the right food that matches the input from my own tank. So which food is right for you, your tank, and your goals will probably be a little bit of trial and error. It's fairly likely that many of the seafood options out there will likely follow that red field ratio and be somewhere close to 10 to one if it came out of the ocean. Not necessarily, but likely. And everything else, who knows? If the number one ingredient on it is a terrestrial animal or beef heart or corn or wheat or yeast, Really, it's kind of unknown, and you'll just have to see. Now, it'd be nice if we could just test the food alone and figure out that ratio, but it probably won't be as helpful as you think because there's all kinds of different organisms in your tank that are uptaking nitrogen and phosphorus at different ratios. There's bacteria, there's corals, there's algae, all kinds of different things in there. And really what we're looking for here is not mad scientists again. We're just looking for trends. So I'm not looking for a weekly pulse on this, but more so like quarterly. If every quarter or month I'm finding out that I just can't keep phosphate down, I can absolutely select a food with less phosphate. Now we're perfecting stability more intelligently rather than trying to correct for instability with filtration media after the fact. So if you see one of these elements rising and the other isn't, try something new with the inputs or the types of food selected. Now, none of the foods that I've run into have a clearly listed nitrogen to phosphorus ratio in the packaging, but what many of them do have is a percentage of protein as well as a percentage of phosphorus, which will get you fairly close so you can make an intelligent change if you want to switch. One specific note here is frozen food frequently has a lower phosphate ratio, often dramatically so. So if you're looking for less phosphate input of the tank, frozen food might be the best bet. One of the most overlooked pieces of this is our stages of the tank. How we feed, what we feed, and the right nutrient levels changes with the age of the tank. What's okay at six months is totally different than it is at year two or three or six or seven. This is probably the most important thing related to nutrients, and it's next. If there's one thing that's the most important in this nutrient series, I believe it's probably understanding the stages of reefing, what I'll call the new reefer mentor paradox. Many new reefers are obviously looking for ways to set up a brand new tank as well as solve some of those inevitable problems that most of us have faced in the first few months or even years. They do that by looking to the mentors, those of us that have actually gone through all those problems before, solved them, and then produced a thriving reef tank that others can emulate. But I'll be frank, I've seen this many, many times, the most experienced of us often forget about where we were and we're focused on where we are today and we miss the entire journey in between and who is actually asking this question. And in relation to nutrients or nitrate and phosphate, this is probably one of the more important aspects because as a five or even 10 year reefer, nutrients, nitrate and phosphate really aren't that big of a factor to my tank, but way back in the beginning, in those first few months, they were. In a relatively new tank, there isn't a lot of competition for nitrate and phosphate because I don't have many corals in the tank. 
meaning it's just building up a battery for pests. I also don't have the coralline algae coverage or microfauna population that protects against many pests or algae. And I actually want my corals to grow up faster, calcify faster, and fill out the tank. So in a new tank, it just matters a lot more than it does five years from now. So solving that paradox is as simple as understanding it's the newer reefers who are asking and it's the established reefers that are answering and we should focus those answers on the beginning of the journey rather than the end. And if we do this right, it will change the trajectory of this person's tank and also accept a little bit of the responsibility that comes with sharing knowledge. Starting with that first stage or first tank, the primary goal here is I just don't want to fail. Meaning a year from now, I want to look back and see a thriving reef tank and know this hobby is for me. That means avoiding common algae and pests that are in new tanks, supporting biodiversity that helps with that, the corals and fish aren't dying, and it wasn't overwhelmingly difficult to achieve. And in terms of nitrate and phosphate, it doesn't have to be difficult. Just test 12 times a year, that's once a month, and it'll give you a pulse on to whether or not you're trending up or trending down, and then just fix those trends. Shoot for a goal of somewhere between one and five parts per million nitrate, and with phosphate, above zero, but below 0 0.1. Staying within those ranges will help manage many of those goals we just mentioned. Also, it fits a skill set appropriate for doing this for your first time. We're not playing mad scientists here trying to peg a specific number, which is a more advanced skill set. And through your monthly tests, if you see that the nitrate and phosphate levels are trending up or rising, you can fix that by just feeding less. Most of the nitrate and phosphate that you're adding to the tank is coming from your food. So if you just stop putting so much food in the tank, it'll actually correct that trend. And if needed, there are also bigger solutions out there like medias that can strip out the phosphate from the tank. You can use GFO, lanthium chloride, or phosphate E if you like. But those are more of a hammer. And in the beginning stages of a reefing, just adjusting the nutrients by the amount of food you put in is probably easier. In fact, you can go the other way. If you find the trend is that you're going closer to zero, zero and not having enough nutrients in the tank, you can just feed more. So that next stage are a few years of reefing and probably many of the people that are watching this, the goals are just different. We've got past those initial hurdles. Let's fill out this tank faster, primarily by stopping the phosphate from inhibiting calcification. Let's make sure that we maintain phosphate levels fairly low so we don't slow down growth in calcification. Let's also avoid longer term pitfalls. A lot of the poor decisions that you make in the first few months don't actually show up until a first few years. So you see these things accumulate over many years. Let's start to identify what they are and solve them. At this point, it's probably becoming more apparent that elevated nutrients or nitrate and phosphate are not just pollutants themselves, but also indicative of a wide range of pollutants that are probably building up in the tank right along with them. If our filtration approach isn't enough to remove the nitrate and phosphate, it's likely that other pollutants are building up over time as well, and we just can't test for them. So that's one of the realities of reefing. There's all kinds of things that we don't know, we can't test for, and we just may never know, but we still have to deal with them and look for those pulses that tell us how. So nutrients is one of them. It gives us that overall pulse of pollution, specifically pollution that comes in with the foods that we input to the tank. It's not just nitrogen and phosphorus. So if we look for those things and have an approach to an overall unpolluted tank, we'll probably reduce the amount of stress-based mortalities that happens in our tank. Some of those mortalities, you just didn't know how they happened, but they're probably coming from some environmental factors, some irritants combined with other stressors in the tank. Let's just remove as many of those as possible. So if you do that, you'll probably make it onto that next stage or journey in reefing, which is that five or 10 year tank where knowledge really isn't holding you back and certainly not knowledge in relation to nutrients or nitrate and phosphate because they just don't matter as much in this type of established tank. If you've made it this far, slow coral growth probably isn't your problem. In fact, it's actually the opposite in many cases where the corals are now growing too fast and filling out the tank and constantly pruning them is now the biggest problem. Algae or other pests are probably not a problem in this established tank. Coralline algae coverage is everywhere. Biological diversity has been established. Stability and bleaching just isn't as big of an issue because most of the other challenges have been solved. So controlling that zooxanthellae population, just really not as important in an established tank like this. Coloration, 
maybe if you're really trying to tune that nitrogen and phosphorus in zooxanthellae population to a specific goal. But this is an end game goal, somebody who's been doing this for a long time, looking for something very specific and advanced approach to reefing. But this is the most important note here for those of us that have made it to this stage with this five and 10 year tank, where many of the things in relation to nutrients just don't matter, or they seem like an afterthought, we have to remember that paradox and that we are the mentors. And so when people ask us for advice, we have to roll back in our minds and remember the entire journey, what helped us be successful in the beginning, not just where we are at today. But the best part of this hobby is there's no single path, no right or best way, just different journeys that lead to relatively the same place, just different amounts of effort, some pain points, and sometimes different levels of success, but all a mix of science, experience, and personal beliefs. So my personal beliefs on my own tanks, coming up next. Nutrition, nutrients, nitrate, and phosphate, this is what's worked on my tanks based on my own personal experiences as well as guidance from my mentors. If you're looking for 100% peer-reviewed science and absolute fact, this isn't it because that doesn't exist and probably won't. This is just my own personal beliefs based on maintaining reef tanks for 17 years. If there's one piece of guidance in relation to nitrate and phosphate that's proved to be the most valuable to me, it's stability and that above all else, not perpetually rising. Because perpetually rising month after month leads only to one place, polluted water and mortalities. Then testing at least once a month is how you track the trends, stop perpetually rising, and find stability. Over the years, I've also changed my own belief or approach to emulating natural seawater levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. Now it's two approaches, a nutritionally rich focus that's focused on dissolved nitrate and phosphate that you can test for but also now includes organic nitrogen and phosphorus, meaning protein, meaning amino acids, and prey. I've also come to terms with managing organic nitrogen and phosphorus in an artificial environment like a reef tank is just a lot harder. That's because there's so many different organisms in the tank they were trying to optimize for, most of which have entirely different needs. They have different mouth shapes, they take different particle sizes, they like different types of food, they react during the day or they react during the night. All kinds of different factors where it's just much more difficult to adapt to their normal environment in the ocean. So that's the foundation of heavy nutrition in and heavy filtration out just accepting there's a wide variety of organisms that we're caring for in these tanks, and they have a wide variety of nutritional needs, and the more effort we put in, the better the results. Really thinking about the particle sizes. Often in foods that have a wide variety of particle sizes measured down into the microns, or even foods that are already broken down into amino acids, which are just easier to utilize for a wide array of corals. However, in terms of stages of tanks in a brand new tank, I avoid both excess nutrition and nutrients because they tend to feed a lot of different pests in the tank. So in this stage of the tank, I'm really caring more about an easy journey of the first year than I am about getting perfect nutrition in the tank. However, if I have a coral that I think will benefit from feeding, especially one that may look damaged or in need of help, I can target feed that specific coral. Most valuable is often using amino acids because it's easiest for it to uptake and use. However, with an established tank that's full of coral, I approach it differently, partially because of time, but also because it's been effective for me, and I look to broadcast feeding, meaning feeding the entire tank amino acids, protein-based prey, particulate foods, and even frozen foods. Frozen foods are easy ways to add things like copepods, rotifers, cyclopods, and other microfauna that are really easy to add with those little blister cubes. Frozen can also mean things like making your own DIY food, going to the fish market or even the grocery store and finding actual types of fish or fish eggs combined with other elements that you can mix together to make a more holistic food for your whole tank. And to be frank, I've seen and experienced an evolution that is getting past the $3 blister packs of shrimp as their only approach to nutrition for the tank. We're taking a deeper look at overall holistic nutritional needs, not just adequate or survival, but looking for thrive in the best we can do this. We've seen this in all types of other pets and dogs and cats as we evolve the way that we've fed them over time, and now you're starting to see it in reefing as well. 
You see it in Rod's Food, who makes a collective approach to seafoods all in one packet. You're also seeing in how many people are doing DIY foods, my own personal approach to reefing. DIY frozen foods are for me because it allows me to adjust the nutrition that goes in there for the fish, not just based on a brine shrimp anymore, but a more holistic approach. And then combined with that, I can add in the things for the corals as well, particulate foods that rehydrate really well when you freeze them in there, specifically the dehydrated ones. You can also add your amino acids and other nutritive elements into the food and have a holistic approach that's not just for the fish, but for the corals too. In terms of inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus or that nitrate and phosphate that you can test for with a test kit, I'm shooting for below 0.1 phosphate and below one part per million nitrate, just trying to eliminate that battery that can fuel algae and pest growth. I'm also more concerned with phosphate because I don't want to slow down coral growth, meaning poisoning of that calcium carbonate crystal, have the phosphate working its way in and stopping the growth. Now it will happen to some degree as high as 0.1, but I just have to have a limit somewhere. I also have a goal in the other direction, meaning above 0.04 phosphate, because I don't want to limit the health or growth of the zooxanthellae or algae that lives within the coral. I also want to be above zero nitrate. Now above zero nitrate, meaning it's actually hard to test for nitrate. So I'm not looking for a specific number here, just looking forward to be at or around one, but not below. This approach adequate for the corals and zooxanthellae, while also avoiding many of the opportunistic pests. And for me, not written in stone, acknowledging that life and deviations are okay. My third son was just born. Water changes immediately became less important than they were the day before, but they will trend back up. And that's really what it's about, is trending towards a goal. Just knowing when you're trending away so you can trend back towards it when you have the time. Also not playing mad scientist, trying to peg a very specific number. And for me, Filter media is that strip out nitrate and phosphate individually, more of a hammer to a solution that I can't solve in any other manner. But I'm really trying to solve those trends. And there's three ways to change the nitrate and phosphate trends in your tank, and they're coming up. Nutrient control and stability for most people is just more simple than it seems. The primary input of nitrate and phosphate into the tank is just food. Meaning if you put more food in, there'll be more nitrate and phosphate. If you put less in, there'll be less. This is an obvious lever, but it's also often missed. And when you get good at this, you can use food control to control phosphate and nitrate independently of each other. However, historically, the goals for nutrients were really not all that clear. It used to be feed as little as humanly possible so we could avoid elevated nitrate and phosphate in the tank. Many people only feeding a few pellets every couple of days. However, during that period of time, fish were mysteriously dying all the time as well. Fast forward to today and food really isn't about nitrate and phosphate anymore because filtration has caught up with the ability to feed. And now food is really about fish nutrition and caring for the nutritional needs of the animal. And now when we're thinking about how do we take care of that animal, we're watching the fish for signs of health, growth, size, color, wounds, and open sores, telling us when we're meeting the needs of the fish and animal. We're also now addressing the obvious, active fish that swim around a lot and burn a lot of calories simply need more food, and once we address that, they just simply stop dying, and it's not really a big surprise after the fact. However, we're now inputting more nitrogen and phosphorus or food in the tank, and so we need to test and find out if it's stable. If it is stable and inside of a range that you're comfortable with, congratulations, you probably don't need to do anything. However, if it's unstable, and you're finding that increased amount of food is causing perpetually rising nitrate and phosphate, you do need to solve, and as long as it fits the nutritional needs of the fish, you can actually just lower the amount of food you put in the tank, and it's as simple as that. But also, you may find that just one of these things is rising, meaning nitrate is stable, but phosphate is rising, or phosphate is stable and nitrate is rising, and you can solve for that as well. Selecting a different food, probably the tool that you use to fix for that, because different foods have different phosphate to nitrate ratios in them, and you can match this to your problem that you're having. So for instance, if you're finding that phosphate is actually really stable in your tank, it doesn't change a lot, but over time, nitrate is rising, you can solve for that by selecting something with a lower nitrogen to phosphorus ratio food. In this case, in most cases, it would actually be a dry food that would have that type of ratio. So if you have stable phosphate but elevating nitrate, maybe try some dry foods or just try different foods to solve for that issue. However, probably more common than that is actually the inverse of that problem where uh, nitrate is actually fairly stable, 
who are constantly having a problem with rising phosphate and we just can't get it to meet our goals. So in that case, try something with a lower phosphate ratio. And in this case, it's frozen foods that typically have a lower content of phosphate. So again, if you're having a problem where stable nitrate but rising phosphate, frozen foods are probably one of the best answers, at least one to try. Pay attention to what's in it. Read the packaging. It could be seafood, algae, terrestrial foods, animals, grains, or fruits. All these things will have different contents of nitrogen and phosphorus, and when you add them to the tank, have a different input ratio. And you can change these things. I'm not saying play mad scientist where you wanna check it every week or even month, but quarterly, consider changing your food to match your needs. But again, if both of these elements are rising, you probably just want to stop feeding so much it's really about feeding the right amount and scale back if it makes sense. However, it doesn't mean you have to hurt the nutritional needs of the fish. There are other ways to actually solve and make sure that they're still getting that nutrition. The biggest opportunity, or at least cheapest opportunity, is probably a feeding ring that just floats on the surface of the water and stops all the fish food from going directly down the drain. The ring holds it in and allows the fish to, to feed out of it. This alone might allow you to feed as much as half as much food and still get the nutrition to the fish. Another tool that many of us have overlooked is the feed modes on our controllers, power heads, and return pumps. These things, again, may allow you to feed half as much while still getting the same amount of nutrition to your fish, meaning half of the nitrogen and phosphorus input, which really kind of means like half the water changes and half the reliance on your uh, filtration as well. So in this case, when we turn off the flow, you'll see the food just slowly sink to the bottom where the fish are capturing a vast majority of it and very little of it is getting blown around and lost in the tank or sucked up into the filtration. The inverse of this is also actually true in many cases. I've seen it in my own tank, which is with flow and bare bottoms, you can actually get it resuspended, meaning after your feed mode is turned off and a lot of the food is settled on the bottom, if I have a bare bottom and flow going across the bottom, it flushes it back up into suspension and very, very little of the food gets lost in the tank. And what does get in there is either eaten or then removed by the filtration as well. It's also sometimes helpful to just acknowledge that you may have a heavy handed approach to feeding just because it's enjoyable. It's one of the ways that we interact with the fish in the tank and just one of the most fun things we can do. So if that's the case, it's helpful to acknowledge that because you can change the type of foods that you use, meaning if we're using pellets, it's high density nutrition, lots of nitrate and phosphate for a very small amount of food. However, with frozen foods, if you look at it, it's actually largely water. So it may feel like you're feeding a lot and frequently, but actually it isn't polluting the tank in the same way. So frozen foods, if you have a heavy hand, maybe just a better option. Also, Acknowledging that means upping our filtration game and finding ways to make sure we take out that excess nitrate, even the excess food, and that's coming up next. One of the biggest challenges in reefing is how many elements of filtration there are in our reef tanks, but how little information there is and how to use them effectively. Done right, you can actually feed nearly as much as you want with very little concern about elevated nutrients or related pollutants. Over the years, it's become pretty apparent to me that refiltration is best looked at in three stages, starting with stage number one, meaning I wanna remove the waste or uneaten food, those whole pellets or whole shrimp, or actually some of the resulting waste that comes from the fish as well, I wanna remove that as there's still a solid. And the best way to do that is actually turns out to be one of the simplest and cheapest ways to do it, it's just the filter socks and pads that are on our tank. So with those filter socks, if you change them out often enough, you can actually remove up to 40% of the phosphate and nutrients from the tank. Now I say 40% less because that's actually the result of a set of experiments we did a while back where we changed up the frequency of when we took out the filter socks. In this case, we found that it was actually about twice a week or every three days or so produced 40% organics or resulting phosphate into the tank. Now 40% is a pretty big number and it might change a little bit on your system design, but 40% is also a lot. And if you think about it, it may actually mean you can do 40% less water changes, and then for yourself you can decide what's harder. Am I changing out a few filter socks a couple times a week, or am I doing more water changes? Which one of these is easier? But you can start to realize how big a deal these little filter socks are that capture the food before it ever has a chance to break down can really be removing half of the total waste. The obvious evolution of that has been the roller mats or felt rolls that are built into many sumps. In this case, 
it's actually rolling it out almost in real time, meaning a lot of that waste is actually only in the tank for a matter of hours rather than days and almost certainly much more effective. However, both of these things are adjustable. In terms of filter socks, if I want to allow more nitrogen and phosphor in this tank because I'm running into what I see as zero, zero, I can just change out these filter socks less. I can actually change them out more often as well. And many of the felt rolls can actually adjust how long you're going to leave the felt in the tank as well, giving you that ability to use the filtration more intelligently and allow control over how much nitrogen, phosphorus, or nutrients are in your tank. Now the second stage of this is food that's settled out in the tank somewhere is going to break down into smaller particles. In this case, it's often the skimmer that is going to pull these out. These dissolved organic compounds contain nitrogen and phosphorus and the skimmer will just strip them out. I've seen claims that they're as effective as 80% or as little as 30%, and it really probably depends on the quality of the skimmer and how you implement it, how you tuned it, and matching the right skimmer to the size of your tank. But in any case, you can probably remove as much as half of the waste this way as well. How well this works for you or what range you find yourself in is often closely tied to how well you understand that this is a foam engine. Meaning the skimmer is an engine that combines air and organics as a fuel to create foam and then the cup collects it. If you have too little air, the skimmer will actually work but only will remove a small amount of fraction. Meaning if you undersize the skimmer or the undersize the amount of air that you needed, it may actually only produce 30% or even lower. However, the inverse of too much air or oversizing the skimmer is maybe actually worse. In this case, there's not enough organics for the amount of air being can put in there and the bubbles just pop. Most often this just looks like a skimmer that clearly has foam top to bottom, but the top just looks like boiling water and nothing is coming out the top. And that's because there's just not enough organics to be able to hold a stable foam head for the volume of air that's coming out of the skimmer. So in this case, I think it's better to have a too small skimmer than too big, but obviously the right answer is to get the right solution for you. Now, one of the things that's really been a problem here is the right solution kind of changes. When I start the tank, I may only have three fish. By the time that the tank is full, I might have 30 fish. And I don't want to buy skimmers along the way. And that's why DC skimmers have become so popular. With a DC skimmer, I can actually adjust the amount of air to fit the amount of organics that are in the tank. Adjusting the amount of air that's going in the skimmer to match the amount of organics in there is probably the best influence that you have on creating wet skimmate, dry skimmate, or no skimmate at all. And best yet, if you have the ability to do that, again, it can meet all kinds of different needs or the whole entire journey of your tank rather than just one point. Outside of DC pumps and the ability to control the speed of the pump, the amount of air it injects into the skimmer, one of the best ways to influence how much air is in there is actually to make sure that the skimmer is installed in the right depth. I mean, the manufacturer has told you that it is best uh, installed at seven inches or 10 inches. And we've actually tested and found that most of them are very, very accurate at that depth as where they perform the best. So make sure to read the instructions. If it says seven inches, do your best to actually get that level of water in your sump because you might be surprised how much it helps with performance. There's also a third stage here. The food must have got past our filter socks or felt, it also got past the skimmer, and now it's just broken down into nitrate and phosphate, and we can test for it in the tank. So in this case, we want to remove that as well, especially if it's consistently rising. And the best ways to do that, I've found, are actually refugiums, algae scrubbers, and algae reactors. Refugium is often the end game solution, meaning in most cases you can get a refugium set up to strip out most of the nitrate or phosphate. In fact, in many cases it might actually work too well. So using a high powered light, it's really easy to actually get algae like this to just soak up all the excess nitrogen and phosphorus. In fact, sometimes it may actually prefer ammonia, meaning you're capturing it before it breaks down into nitrate in some cases. So refugium is that end game solution. They're also adjustable meaning that uh, I don't necessarily need to have them on for 12 hours a day. If I'm finding I got zero, zero uh, nitrate and phosphate, I can shrink it down to eight hours. I can shrink it down to two hours. I could actually do alternating days. I don't even have to have it on, but two days a week. I can adjust the light. I can turn down the intensity of the light and the rate of photosynthesis and uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus to meet those needs. Probably the most tunable end game solution for nitrate and phosphate. LG Reactor, almost the exact same thing. It's like a refugium in a can. 
The can meaning I can actually put it in a vertical space in my uh, sump area or even inside the sump and save a lot of space. It's also a lot cleaner, tends to have less odor in it. So just a cleaner way to implement a refugium in your tank, but producing almost the same results. Working on a similar principle to that is the algae scrubber, but it's also a much smaller form factor and works a little bit different. In this case, you have a screen in there that will grow uh, hair algae on it and you'll just harvest it. And part of the benefit here is that hair algae is actually a simpler form of algae and it just grows a lot faster and uptakes nitrogen and phosphorus faster. So you can get similar performance as a much larger refugium in a tiny little form factor. So a little bit more maintenance, harvesting and maintaining it, but you save a lot of space. You can see the three prong approach here. Capture the waste as it's whole. Capture when it's broken down into proteins or dissolved organics and then also capture what we've missed. And these probably the best solutions for me. However, even though I don't use this method very often myself, I don't want to overlook carbon dosing and bacteria, which is also kind of a stage three where you're gonna strip out the nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate and phosphate from the tank once it's already broken down. Now this method isn't as well understood, but basically you're gonna dose organic carbon to the tank, which will promote an explosion of the bacteria in the tank. They will strip out the nitrate and phosphate as they grow that population. It's also notable that carbon dosing is one of those things that can actually work too well as well, meaning that you're gonna end up getting closer to that zero, zero or zero nitrate and phosphate in the tank, which is unhealthy for the corals. So the best systems actually acknowledge that to be the case and then address it with the heavy in, heavy out, meaning Red Seas NO3 PO4X also has the nutrition additives, meaning you're dosing the carbohydrates as well as amino acids into the tank to address for the fact that we have a total approach to nutrition. Again, the best carbon dosing uh, additive systems actually addressing that up front rather than letting you find it out later. And KZ Zeovit probably being the most time tested approach to carbon dosing, and from the very beginning, ultra low nutrients or nitrate and phosphate combined with ultra high nutrition via many of the additives that they put in the tank, as well as using the Zeovit rocks to produce bacterial mulm that will also feed the corals. So in this case, consistently long-term results achieved with Zeovit and probably the most robust time-tested carbon dosing method. It's also helpful to know there's other tools out there that will help all of these filtration methods work better. For instance, flow will help almost all of them work better by keeping all of the waste suspended in the water for as long as possible. And flow in a bare bottom will actually keep it out of the sand as well and suspended where the filtration can get it. And if these things aren't working all together in like things like phosphate or just perpetually rising, there are bigger hammer type solutions like GFO or lanthium chloride or phosphate E that you can use intelligently as needed. All this filtration based on replacing an older approach of reliance on water changes and physically swapping out old water with new. So what is water changes role in nutrient and pollution control in today's modern tanks? That's next. Water changes a hammer solution to nutrient control in reefing chemistry for ages Replacing poor quality polluted water with new water on a regular basis just works, but how valuable are they? In terms of nutrient or nitrate and phosphate control, there's no question dilution does work, but exactly how effective is it when I do a 10% water change? Meaning 90% of whatever was in there is still in there. And so if I had 10 parts per million nitrate and I did a 10% water change, it probably just fell to nine parts per million and then you need to ask yourself, would I even be able to measure that with a common nitrate test kit? And the answer is probably no. It's also the most manual and often most expensive method of nutrient control. So just how valuable is it? Well, for me, I would actually call it pretty valuable and part of my overall approach. And 10% weekly is what I recommend to most people, only second to an otter water change system that change out a small amount every day. Not really because it's a solution to nitrate and phosphate problems, because feeding and filtration seems to solve that, but it's the buffer for all those inevitable mistakes. It's a buffer for when you may not be testing as often as you should, or maybe if your approach is not to test at all, it also catches things that you can't test for, meaning nitrate and phosphate we can fairly easily test for, but there's many things that come in with additives or foods that may pollute the tank in the water, but you can't test for them at all, 
So that dilution approach or water change of removing the polluted water and replacing it with fresh water just works. Water changes also help you catch a different type of pollution or toxin that is not as easy to recognize. Meaning things that are acutely toxic that you put in your tank right now, you probably see immediately and be able to attribute. But there are other things that build up over the course of years rather than weeks or months. In that case, it's actually hard to identify when they build up or what you'd attribute them to. So an approach to dilution actually just solves that altogether. Water changes are also a component of that stages of reefing conversation, meaning they might just matter a lot more upfront on that first tank or when you're setting up a brand new tank because they're just a catch-all for all kinds of different mistakes that you can make in the tank or also limited approaches or less effective approaches to filtration or even heavy-handed feeding common with new tanks. However, sometimes water changes just matter a lot less, which is typical with older tanks, more established four, five, and six year plus tanks that are just filled with coral. But there's often a lot of biological uptake happening in the tanks, but also sometimes that mentality actually catches up as well. There's occasional but ongoing mortalities going in the tank, and there really isn't an explanation why a coral is kicking the bucket every three months. Sometimes just tied to an aging or older mentality of things just die, which of course isn't true. Something caused that animal to die in the tank. And water changes are often just a useful buffer against the unknown. So that's probably the biggest thing to pick up today. There's just a lot of unknowns in reefing. And how those things accumulate over time even more so. I mean, we all have different sized tanks, we have different export methods, different water change schedules, and we all use different additives and different amounts of them. And there's very little knowledge on the prolonged impact of using them over many years. And so part of that is just acknowledging the unknown and then accounting for it produces predictively improved results and water changes probably the best way to do it. That said, water changes are not my favorite task, and because of that, they can go to the wayside over time. So the biggest thing we can do is just make them easier. So one of the things you could do is use something like a python, which makes it much easier to suck water out of the tank and have it go directly down the drain without having a mess on the floor. You can also decide how you go about it, meaning do I change out 30% once a month just because it's easier to only have to do this 12 times a year? However, in that case, I'm getting the hose out and I'm probably making a big mess, or is it easier just to do 10% once a week where maybe it's only one or two buckets and it's just really easy to do? And then really, is an out of water change system like the dose from Neptune worth it? Where now all I need to do is fill up my bin with salt water and maybe only change it or fill it every month or two. If you can implement an out of water change system on your tank, it's probably not just the reason why you're gonna be doing water changes consistently six months from now, it's why you're going to be doing them consistently six years from now, and why between here and there, you're probably gonna run into fewer issues along the way. So the next big question, this series has been nearly everything I've experienced and learned about nutrition and nutrients, the ocean and our reef tanks. So what's next? The answer is, I don't know. You'll have to subscribe and check out our channel page to find out, but there will be more.